Good evening and welcome. Tonight we will be going over the history and geography of Anhui in China. Anhui looks very big on this map, but it's actually um, one of these smaller regions of China. It's not as large as some of the others, which is like, wow, it really puts China into perspective, doesn't it? Because this is quite a chunk of land here. But I think it's also because this map is very zoomed in on just eastern China, so it's a, it's, it's, we all win. It's a good benefit. We can see all the details of this region. Anhui has a really incredible, incredible it's very much dominated by many rivers that are heading out into the Yellow Sea and the East China Sea. Out here we've got, you know, Shanghai is just around the corner, Nanjing, um, these major centers that rely on the river systems and the water, and then all flows through Anhui. Of course, the most important river you can see huge chunk here is the Yangtze River, the, or I should say one of the most important rivers in the world, not just China, but one of the most important rivers in world history. There's a lot happening on this river. So more in the north, you have more of a farmland area, really relying on the waters of the various rivers. Lots of canals and dams and reservoirs up there, which is of course very important for agriculture, but the main crop grown here of course is rice, which you have to grow in water, so having a good water supply is doubly important. The further south you go, the more mountainous it gets, and you get some of China's most incredible mountain ranges and mountain landscapes. You have, I'm not sure if it's on this map, around, doo -doo -doo, around here would be the Tianzhou Mountains. The Tianzhou Mountain. And then down here near Huangshan is the Huangshan Mountains, and Huangshan Mountain is just about there, which is called the most beautiful mountain in China. And, you know, why don't we start with that? Because Mount Huangshan and many of the towns in the south here are UNESCO World Heritage Sites, so let's start with that. I love when I get comments that say, I love when you do the UNESCO sites because I love them too. So we're going to start by looking at the ancient villages of southern Anhui, Shidi, and Hongkun. It says, the two traditional villages of Shidi and Hongkun preserve to a remarkable extent the appearance of non-urban settlements of a type that largely disappeared or was transformed during the last century street plan, their architecture and decoration, and the integration of houses with comprehensive water systems are unique surviving examples. So if we look at the gallery here, these are mainly pictures of Hong Kun. It's, from what I can tell, the more tourist-friendly of these ancient towns, but these cities remained almost pretty much untouched during the more, like, China's Industrial Revolution in the latter half of the 19th century. And you get these really pretty ponds here that are important for village life. And the most famous site is this little footbridge going over the pond there. Isn't that very cool? You still have all of the little traditional homes and the 
the rooms that they'd have are still very much how they would have looked a hundred years ago, maybe even two hundred years ago. It's very, very beautiful. The next we have Mount Huangshan. Huangshan, known as the loveliest mountain in China, was acclaimed through art and literature during a good part of Chinese history, e.g. the San Shui mountain in water style of the mid-16th century. You'll see some examples of that. Today it holds the same fascination for visitors, poets, painters, and photographers who come on pilgrimage to the site, which is renowned for its magnificent scenery made up of many granite peaks and rocks emerging out of a sea of clouds. Let's take a look at Mount Huangshan. It's very haunting, these pretty trees and these big gorgeous rocks. And this is a pretty good picture of the typical landscape here. The greenery peeking through these big peaks and the gorgeous trees there. There's some examples of the art style. Look at these. Look at that. Wow. So gorgeous. Alright, I'll have to show you some later because it's really pretty. Um, <laughs> How they just kind of take the black ink and just go brush, brush, brush. Just all frantically and then they are finished and it's this picture. <laughs> but in beautiful black ink and all these little leaves are little Bob Ross style strokes and stuff. It's really pretty. But I'll show you way more of this place on Google Earth after. There is one other UNESCO site in Anhui, and that is the Grand Canal. Um, most of the Grand Canal is not in Anhui, and I'm not really going to go over it, like, at all in its history. But, um, the regions that it is most prominent in, we're not going to talk about for a while, so... I figured I may as well just mention it now. Let's read about it. The Grand Canal is a vast waterway system in the northeastern and central eastern plains of China, running from Beijing in the north to Zhejiang province in the south. Constructed in sections from the 5th century BCE onwards, it was conceived as a unified means of communication for the empire for the first time in the 7th century CE during the Sui Dynasty. This led to a series of gigantic construction sites, creating the world's largest and most extensive civil engineering project prior to the Industrial Revolution. It formed the backbone of the Empire's inland communication system, transporting grain and strategic raw materials, and supplying rice to feed the population. By the 13th century, it consisted of more than 2,000 kilometers of artificial waterways, linking five of China's main river basins. It has played an important role in ensuring the country's economic prosperity and stability, and is still in use today as a major means of communication. So let's check out some pictures. It's kind of hard to take a picture of a massive canal, so you can see these pretty waterways here. But what I like is um, this picture up here of the fisherman with his cormorants. Does anyone remember this children's book about a duck named Ping? It was pretty much like the Chinese version of Ugly Duckling where this duckling got picked up into this cormorant fishing family and the duck is desperately trying to fish like the cormorant. And he can't because he's a duck, you know. Does anyone else remember that book? That was like way back in my childhood, but I saw this picture and I just flashed back instantly to reading about Ping. So I like this picture a lot. But anyway, that's all that I have for you tonight about UNESCO sites. Let's get into the history of this region because, of course, it being China and it being Eastern China, it just has, like, way too much history to talk about, so I'm going to give you the bullet points. 
this region was traditionally known as Wan, way, way back in the very, very ancient dynasties before China was first unified. Once China was unified during the Qin Dynasty, migration came in to this area from many different peoples. And in fact, it's one of the first places where the Han Chinese first settled down, which is vastly important to Chinese history because the majority of Chinese people call themselves Han Chinese. They are the descendants of the early Han, and yeah, if you speak to a Chinese person, they'll know what you're talking about if you say, are you Han Chinese or not? Most people, especially if they're from like mainland China, are Han Chinese. There's many, many different ethnic groups within China, many different Chinese ethnic groups, but the Han are like the majority, you know? So very cool. Of course, there were many different canals, not just the Grand Canal that we read about, but many canals in the north built um, extensively throughout the history here to help the farmers here to grow their rice and various crops. The first interesting news, well not interesting news, but the first interesting historical fact that had like a date attached to it that happened in this region would have been in the 1850s. There was a peasant uprising when the Huang He River, which is the Yellow River, was um, diverted. I, I couldn't find if it was diverted by man or by a natural reason, but I assume it was a man-made diversion because the people rose up in protest because they weren't getting enough water. It wasn't long after that, um, once Europeans are becoming a major power in Asia, in China it would have been the British in particular, you also had the Dutch and even the Portuguese in other parts of China. But once they became a major power over here, China realized they needed to shape up, especially after they lost the Opium Wars to Britain. and they plotted out what they called the self-strengthening plan. And part of that self-strengthening plan happened in Anhui. And that was a plan to industrialize, industrialize, industrialize. Kind of foreshadowing what was to come in China's history. So many, many factories were built, mainly in cities here like Wuhu, so much Hefei at that point. Um, Anqing, there's a lot of their industry um, along the river, obviously. You would need all of those supplies going out, right? So this area became very, very industrialized, and um, Wuhu even became a foreign trading point in 1860 because you could sail down the river and reach there but it wasn't nearly as prominent as the many, many others along the coast here, right? Like, you'd have to sail past some major, major city centers to get there. So it was never as big as many of the others. The next fact with a date attached to it that was very important would have been in 1938, which was a very bad time to be in China because Japan was invading. And I'm not going to get into the details of what happened when Japan invaded China because, oh boy, it is gruesome and not relaxing and not YouTube friendly to talk about. But in a nutshell, the Japanese invaded and they were destroying the land and the people as they went. So Chiang Kai-shek was in charge of China at the time, and he had an idea to blow up a dam on the Huanghe River, the Yellow River, to flood the region and keep the Japanese out. So again, that was 1938, and it did prevent the Japanese from 
encroaching a little further into China. But it also drowned about 900,000 people in Anhui. That is such an astronomical number. It really goes to show just how big China's population was, is, and always has been that that many people could die from a dam bursting. But like how absolutely devastating to the region. And what's sad is that if you don't know about Japan's invasion of China, um, you think like that couldn't have been better than if Japan invaded and TPH it probably was. Like more people could have died from the Japanese soldiers than from that flood and the subsequent famine that happened because of course all the fields are flooded. You can't grow rice. You can't grow food. Which, I mean, is just a testament to how vicious the Japanese army was at the time. But just an absolutely devastating chapter in China's history. Its occupation during World War II. So many into that, like I said, at least not the details of it. So after the war, Japan loses, China completely flips on its head and becomes the People's Republic of China, and there were various periods in Anhui and throughout China, but we're talking about this area, where the economy absolutely boomed, and the first would have been in the 1950s, at the very start of the new country and it had lots of ups and downs you know we had the cultural revolution which was a big down and then once that policy was taken away in the 1980s it went way back up again and this is when the city of Hefei up here really blossomed and is now a major 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 Chinese city the, the region has been prospering pretty much ever since, I want to say, the 1980s, 1990s. Of course, ups and downs in its economy during, you know, 2008, 2020, so on and so forth. But it's been on an upward trend since the 1980s. If you don't know, the Cultural Revolution was this plan to go back to more traditional lifestyle and it was very convoluted. The government split up the entire country and um, designated like this is a farming zone, this is a industry zone, this is a manufacturing zone, um, which was just a big crisis. If some of you remember mm, a year or two ago when I lived in California, my landlady told me one day about how she was this um, math student in high school. She had like a scholarship to go to university to study math and then the Cultural Revolution happened and she was forced into the countryside to farm rice. And she said she never went back to school after that. She just never had the time, which was like, oh my gosh, but that's how it was. But, she never actually told me where she lived, so she probably wasn't from here, to be honest, but um, it's just a, a good example of the ups and downs of China's economy in the last half of the 20th century, while it was still figuring itself out. It's a communist country. But, that's about all I have for you for its history. Let's grab the tablet. I will show you some amazing places in this region. Oops. And of course, I immediately click off of it. One second. Here we go. I'm sure you can see that well. Um, let's start off with a look at this slideshow here. So, most of these are... Oh, look at that big solar panel farm. My goodness. Most of these are pictures of Hefei. So, you can see... The more modern, this is more traditional here in the mountains. But very, very modernized city you can see there. Along the river, that's pretty. That's near the mountains. Um, 
Um, I think that's on Qing. A much more traditional tale. Not th it is modern, but not as modern as a fae and woo. Um, well, that's really pretty. <laughs> but let's take a look. I want to show you something neat before I forget about it. Is I was cruising along the river. I was giving myself a little Yangtze River cruise, and I came across, I think it was on Qing. Just look at how efficient these areas of the city have been planned. Like it's, it, it looks like lines on paper, right? These are all little buildings. It's really, really fascinating, I think. Go over here. Very, very efficient, isn't it? And that's all part of China's various times of modernization and industrialization. There's Nanjing, we're not going to go over there. That is not in our region. Here is the city of Wuhu. Kind of like to juxtapose what Nanjing looked like. You can kind of see how it's more spread out, <laughs> I want to say. You can see the little areas there of industry. But, um, I don't know, it just kind of struck me. See, like even here, it's all lined up very neatly, but you can see all kinds of different structures and how Anqing was all very similar. I don't know, that just struck me as very interesting. Let's take a look at another secret. Even more kind of diversified buildings, but it is such a sprawling, sprawling city, isn't it? I think there was a cool museum I wanted to show you. I can't remember if it was the science... Oh, was this the place? This building was, yes, this building looks like a UFO. <laughs> like, the rest of the slideshow is fine, but I just thought that this building, it's a UFO. How cool is that? <laughs> That's so, so neat. But yeah, there's lots to explore, obviously, in a big, big city like this. I encourage you to... Um, play around on Google Earth and see if you find anything else really, really cool because there are lots of other cool things in the city to see. That was just my favorite thing, is that there's a UFO building. I love that. So let's look up here in the north real quick. Um, I liked to play a game where I just zoomed in until I saw rice patties. So let's go. Let's like go over here. Zoom in until you see rice. This is not rice. <laughs> the one time I was, I knew it would happen. But, like, look how many different little patches of farmland we got. It is so extensive. Let's go over here. Nope. No rice. We're gonna play Zoom till you find rice. Let's go over here. Mmm. -hmm. Play it in your own time. <laughs> I did it five or six times until I was like, there's rice patties. But I want to show you more of these beautiful mountains. So let's see. China on Google Earth is kind of a pain in the you-know-what. Because a lot of things aren't labeled correctly. And a lot of places that are don't have any pictures. So it's hard to see. But... Um, let me zoom in a bit, so you can kind of see a good example of this beautiful mountain landscape. How pretty is that? Isn't that nice? And then it flows down to the city down here in the shadows of the mountains. So beautiful. But of course the ones I really want to show you. Or not far enough. We need to go to. Oh. Maybe I'm crooked. Hold on. Yeah, I'm crooked. There we go. Now I get it south. There's Anqing. 
there's Huang Shan. Okay, <laughs> I was trying to head south. So here's Huang Shan City down here, but um, actually there's some pretty pictures of Mount Huang Shan in the city's slideshow, even though the mountain's further up. But here you can see the little traditional town, modern. much more traditional town, as you can see. But with its modernization, of course, the big village ponds here in the middle of the old towns, the old buildings there. It's a neat observation up on Mount, observatory on Mount Huangshan. Looks like a planetarium, maybe. But here's the beautiful, beautiful mountain peaks with those gorgeous trees. It's so, so nice. There's lots of cool old paths through these mountains that you can hike through. They look very exhausting, but worth it for these spectacular views. So, so pretty. Look at this hiking path. My goodness. But, I mean, you get to see China's most beautiful mountain, right? So, here it is. Huangshan Mountain. Which, actually, before I show you the slideshow, let's look at it in three. which I think is so neat because look at all of these straight lines. Actually, if I show you in 2D, you can see it a little better. All of the rivers cutting through this soft, soft rock, creating these very, very just prominent lines. Now, I always say on my channel that Mother Nature doesn't make straight lines, but there's a couple places on this planet where you can find neat, natural lines like It is just so, so beautiful. You can see why they said like poets and painters take pilgrimages here because this landscape is just so stunning. And look, you can ride um, these little guys. What are they called? I forget. They give me anxiety, so I never ride in that. It's that big observatory. Gondolas, that's what they're Maybe if I ever came here, I would write in those just to get these beautiful views. Oh, the gorgeous forests here. These beautiful soft rocks. They almost look like they're soft to the touch, like they're pillows, right? And then some of them are very jagged. So, so pretty. It's very old. Pretty waterfall here. I am going to end it on this waterfall. You can see some of that straight line action happening. But I'm going to actually end it here. There are many other sites that I could show you, but um, I feel like I'd just be repeating myself, being like, look, it's so beautiful. watching. If you enjoyed this style of content, please consider subscribing as this is an ongoing series on my channel. Next, we're going to be heading to, you guessed it, Nauru. Good old Nauru. Friend of the channel. <laughs> Beloved by all. We're gonna go explore Nauru some more, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. I hope that you found this video to be relaxing and educational. You have